And you know, it's funny is the Dunwich Horror, and I know we're going to get into the story more. Uh, it's kind of funny is it's, it's, you know, the, I think it has one of the more happier endings in a way. Well, you know, the, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was reading uh, another plug because we're going to have them on eventually, uh, S.T. Joshi's right. H.P. Lovecraft. This is the Bible. If you want to read a biography about Lovecraft, you go, it's very long and detailed, but it's fantastic. But anyway, S.T. points that out. And he criticizes Dunwich Horror because it is sort of a story about good versus evil. It is, it, you know, and, I, and again, August Derleth, you know, praise be his name, who basically collected and published the works of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, the reason I never was a big fan of uh, uh, Derleth's work is because it, it, it went back to the Judeo-Christianity type of good versus evil model, yeah. which isn't what's interesting you know, for me, I mean, the cosmic horror and the and our insignificance in the universe is what intellectually I find. Wait, sorry, that. sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. Somebody wants to talk. I I, I didn't mention this, but I do have a guest for this episode. <laughs> is that okay? It. Can I bring yeah. him on? Okay. Are right, you you come on? You can come on. Hi. <laughs> it's the Wizard Waitley. <laughs> Someday you'll see a child of the Vinnies up on Sentinel Hill calling his father's name. Actually, <laughs> I, I had to show. I had to show this. This is actually a, a thing of Dr. John D, which also relates to uh, Dunwich Horror. And this was a play I was supposed to do this year, but we can't do plays. I, I, I did an adaptation of his stories, and he relates to Lovecraft quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So in the yeah. Dunwich Horror, uh, which is really the first time we really get a lot of stuff about the Necronomicon, uh, uh, Wilbur mentions how he's got a copy of John D's translation, mm -hmm. right? And that's maybe the first time I heard about D and it got me interested in D. And yeah. when you dive into D, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, he was the astrologer to Queen Elizabeth the first, and he was trying to find the secrets of the universe by talking with angels. But he was, he was trying to get the language of Adam, which is part of the Lovecraft country uh, mm -hmm. you know, yep. adaptations too. And if you get this book, <laughs> there's a lot of books in this issue, in this episode. This is his spiritual diaries, which you can see I made a few notes with. For my uh, just a few, John. Just yeah. And it's amazing because what he would do, he, D couldn't talk to the spirits. He had a guy named Ke Kelly. We're going off track here a little bit. Edward Kelly, who could actually scry for him. And D would ask questions and then do shorthand in the answers. And their answers are just amazing. I mean, just this amazing kind of Shakespearean dialogue, you know. But anyway, what, what he was trying to find was the language of Adam, and he writes down the language of Adam, and I swear to fucking God, it sounds like Lovecraft. I mean, it sounds like Lovecraft's mm -hmm. language. Yeah. So I'm interested. I, I don't know how much Lovecraft knew about John Dee, if he went that deep and actually kind of read some of these diaries. We got to ask, when we bring on ST, we got to ask that question, because as, as you know, Lovecraft was constantly researching, you know, libraries and other information to get... Uh, you know, as much detail on things that he was interested in. And I, I'm pretty sure he would have been influenced by. Uh, well, you know, you know, uh, I, I remember ST saying once because, you know, there is that's, that's a whole episode we can do about Lovecraft and the occult and, you know, all, all these theories that he was really doing magic and, you know, the old ones are real and all that kind of stuff. But ST once said his knowledge of the occult was whatever was in the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> You know, yeah. basically, you know, those things. So, you, it, but I don't know. I mean, it, there, there's a lot of like parallels between, between him and Dr. D and him actually bringing it up in the, in, in the Dunwich Horror, I thought was pretty interesting. And, and just before we transition off of, you know, uh, John D here, a, <laughs> a little more contemporary reference too, if you didn't know, is Neil What Damon. do you mean? Yes. He I, looks just like you, John. I think he, you, know, you really modeled it after you. It's, and just, kind, of, it's kind of Dan O'Bannon-ish, too, a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. It, it kind anyway, of hopefully like, next year, if you're in Los Angeles, you'll see this play. So oh, we'll see. I'd love to. <laughs> hopefully I'm not talking to time. you. I'm talking to the audience. Oh, no, I want <laughs> I to. care about you. <laughs> audience. Uh, whatever. But um, I was just saying, John D., the you know, more contemporary uh, reference for audience members might be Neil Gaiman's um, uh, uh, Sandman. Yeah, because, yeah, he's in Sandman. Yeah, yeah. Doctor Destiny is John D. So yeah, a little aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Anyway, so well, we, the well, they also think like if you go into the uh, Shakespeare's one play that it, well, not one play, but 
uh, that he kind of wrote by himself. It was an adaptation, was The Tempest. Mm -hmm. And of course, who's in the, uh, Prospero, the magician, and he's really D, you know, and he talks about his books and getting rid of his books and all that kind of stuff. And there is a theory that Shakespeare was like John D. secretary for a while. I mean, who knows? This is all, you know, a conjecture. Uh, but um, Prospero is like John D. I mean, the way people play him. Uh, anyway. So. That, that's cool. So let's go back, reel it back a little bit. <laughs> let's talk to the love uh, Yeah, and get back to the story. So we were talking about, you know, the story kind of has a happy ending. It feels very you know, simplicity. Well, why, don't you, why don't you talk about the movie itself? Like, go over the, okay. give a brief description of it. Yeah, you're talking about the Dunwich Horror, right? The, the movie adaptation by movie. Uh, Corman and, and Daniel Haller, who we got to interview. Yeah. He's no longer with us, is he? I don't no, he, he passed. But we were the last ones to get an interview with him, too. So We were? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I mean, like, over the years, people have asked, can we, you know, cite this? And, and I was like, sure. Yeah. But, um, you know, Dan, uh, when, you know, we met him up. Uh, uh, you know, he was pretty frail at the time, but it was kind of interesting, you know, he, cause he was an art director, right? He was an art yeah. director on Haunted Palace. He, um, you know, he was given some opportunities to direct, right? And uh, the Dunwich Horror, you know, felt pretty sloppy, it, you know, it was like early seventies, right? And- Well, uh, it's of its time, definitely, you know, <laughs> 1970 well, was my- well, Remember when we were talking to him, he says, yeah, we just, we were, we were in a- <laughs> Like a kid. <laughs> yeah, we were in a lounge and drinking and we just wrote it on cocktail nap napkins and you know, it you know, there is a structure and that you know they just they kind of knock it out. You know, and, you know, uh, another another thing, sorry to interrupt you, but you know, you know how like Lovecraft became very sexual, all these movie adaptations, especially with Stuart, Stuart Gordon stuff, my, my very, old buddy. Very, very. But um he this was the first, I guess, because it, it gets fair. Now, we think it's because of Rosemary's Baby, but there's real some sexual yeah. elements to this thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, if you look at the poster, you know, uh, I can't. I mean, yeah, yeah, right. that's a cool poster. Look, wrong way. I'll go this way. Um, <laughs> you know, interesting is, you know, I'm a poster collector, as you know, John, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'll put the artist information up here later. But, like, the artist who uh, painted this, this was, like, his last poster in Hollywood. He wow. was he was just burnt out. He got tired of like the exploitation. Like he didn't really get to be an artist. And you can tell if you look at the poster elements, it's very satanic, you yeah. know, and, and it really is uh, trying to tie into a more contemporary and I, I think more, um, you know, mainstream notion of horror, uh, which again, is not, it, it's the opposite of anything that we like about Lovecraft and cosmic horror, because it's not about, you know, God versus the devil, it's not Satan, it's not Judeo Christianity. It's really about again the, our 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 position in the universe and how we are insignificant and that there's all these other things before and after humans and that like we're arrogant. We think that we we are the right. And that's that's why uh Dunwich Horror is kind of an outlier in his work. Because mm -hmm. it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, we are very know. important. We gotta defeat the evil creature, you know. Um that's why I never really liked it because it 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 felt against you know, uh, you know, most of the tenets that I think he, you know, Lovecraft uh, was trying to uh, focus on in terms of cosmic. Well, well, let's talk about the movie first a little bit more. You know. Uh, okay, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, you know, it, we've got our our cast of characters. You know, uh, you know, I, I think the sexual aspect you were bringing about, you know, having uh, Sandra D as part of the, uh, um, you know, the cast and the, you know, that you know. The, the the making use of in terms of publicity and marketing the fact that you know she was on a she was naked on the the right. sound stage and they had to reduce it was all for publicity right this was yeah. all just to get um you know attention to the, the set and it and it was very rosemary's baby you know let's let's face it yeah it, rosemary's it, baby is like two years before this yeah and uh, and of course of course that is a part of the plot of you know where um lavinia uh has um uh, conceives this child through yog sothoth somehow okay. you know so and but we'll talk about that later because it's part of a it's sort of the hero's journey uh you know uh, it follows that with a m miraculous birth and all that stuff but i'll talk about that a little later but yeah i, I mean and it's it's funny because i mentioned I, I saw at the recent lovecraft festival there's a movie called uh, the deep ones yep did you did you ever watch you never you did watch it okay so that's rosemary's baby too isn't it yeah, it it really is. I mean, it's a pa the parallels are are there. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good film. You know, I hope I hope you liked it. <laughs> I don't know. Well, yeah, 
rape scene. Talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, yeah. You know, overall, it was uh, you know, it's very much like that. The cult, and you know, being part of the yeah. cult, and then you know. Well, I thought while well, we're getting off track, but the deep ones, you know, it, it really was Rosemary's Baby in the sense of the weird characters, you know, because Rosemary's Baby have all these eccentric characters that you would not think were Satanists. You know, mm -hmm. the old lady, you know, the old guy and all this kind of stuff. And um, and that's what The Deep Ones does, too, pretty well. There, There's some great little characters in it, I thought. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So so the movie version um, also has Ed uh, Bagley Sr. in it playing yeah. Dr. Willett. And he's great in it. Yeah, I think I got, oh, am I in, is he, is he in there? Nope. But no, there's, there's Sam Jeff. You mentioned right there. But yeah, I mean... And of course, Dean Stockwell, he he gives a really good performance of it, uh, of Wilbur, although he's nothing like Wilbur in the, yeah, right, that was all it, because remember when we, were, when we were talking to Dan, he mentioned that, we we asked him about all that ritual stuff, mm -hmm. and he said it was all Dean, right, it was all Stockwell. Mm -hmm. We should try to get him sometime to talk, yeah. I wonder if he would talk about it. Why not? Why didn't we interview him for the book? You know, that's, John. So we're stupid. I don't know <laughs> we're stupid, I mean. I mean, that the book already had, you know, in that second edition, hundreds of pages cut out because of size. So, yeah. you know, but I, I think using this form or other, you know, you know, web, website or whatever, we, we can definitely keep, you know, expanding this, this volume of, uh, you know, unnatural lore here. <laughs> <laughs> when so, a man was not meant to know. Yeah. You know, well, you know anyway, in, in, in the story, yeah, in the movie, it, it's, it's said, uh, it's said on, um, the UCLA campus standing in for, although they don't call it Miskatonic, they call it uh, Arkham University, which is interesting. Yeah, I, I don't. I wonder why they did that. I, you know, yeah. it, it's like there's little weird changes. That, you know, yeah, maybe it's yeah. easier to say. I don't know, but um, it, yeah, maybe it's just easier to say. You know, yeah, you know, let's make it easier for the actors. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, Miskatonic sounds a little wonky, right? Although it sounds appropriate, but um, yeah. But the movie, you know, uh, well, one thing I got to say is that. Um, the, I love the opening credits, you know, with yes. the, you know. the cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that stuff, it, it sets the tone. But that's that, Satan too, or Satan swallows him or Pan yeah. or somebody, you know. I, and, and this is where I just get kind of like film adaptations, especially in the seventies, because I think the influence of all the devil worshiping and, and, uh, Oh, know. and that goddamn Les Baxter score, man. I, you know, it's so dumb for this movie. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, <laughs> but with the drums and you know it's like it's it's, it's just of his time you know it's uh it, yeah the it's editing very... style you know the real choppy editing and um but i i like a lot of this movie though it's entertaining i think yeah it's it's okay you know it's just again you know it, it's the classic thing for those of us who are excited to see an adaptation and then we're disappointed but you know I, by, by this stage you know most of the time, you know, you set your expectations pretty low because most most people don't get it, and especially back in the day, the early adaptations clearly don't get it, or or the marketing departments and publicity departments want to go in a different direction, right? You know, mm -hmm. because well, how are we going to sell this? Cosmic Horror is hard to sell, but hey, you know, Satanism is hot, you know, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. literally. <laughs> yeah. and, and I just find again, it's the antithesis of of really what the cosmic horror weird tale tradition really is. You know, it's interesting you, you say that too, because uh, as marking, um, it's very, I mean, the Dunwich Horror itself, the story becomes very cosmic when he talks about the plan of the old ones, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, just, just read a, a quick quote from it. If I can do this, let's see. If, uh, in the way. Sure. Yeah, but it. so, there, you know, this is like, uh, you know, Armitage was discovering what's going on. And, um, and he said he would shout that the world was in danger since the elder things wished to strip it and drag it away from the solar system and cosmos of matter into some other plane or phase of entity from which it had once fallen. Vigentiliness of aeons ago. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, taking taking the world and, and and taking it into another dimension and why that we don't know exactly, um, but there's a lot of cosmic stuff in this. You know that uh, that the story, well, at least this adaptation didn't do uh, much of it at all. You know, it's just uh, 
again, it was like a satanic mass at the end of it. Yeah, you know, exactly. Right? And, and but the whole thing about let's let's you know introduce the you know a, the the multi-dimensional alter universe type of entities and let's impregnate humans. It just for ah, oh, just not my not my vehicle. Well, well, the the other thing too is about I never understood about the Cthulhu cult why anybody would join this. <laughs> But then well, I never understood why people would join the Republican Party. So, you know, I mean, so. but, but well, there's, a, there's a quote, there's a quote from Wilbur here. Um, and he's talking about himself. And, and oh, first, we should describe Wilbur, which, you know, Dean Stockwell is, is great in, in, in the Dunwich Horror movie, but he's nothing like Wilbur Whateley, the way Lovecraft describes him. He's um, too short. You know, he's not like eight feet tall with little eh, you know, things. Well, out. this... I don't know if people have read this, but this is Providence. Yeah, the uh, comic book. The comic Providence. book by Alan Moore. Mm -hmm. And it's a deep dive. In a, and his, his conceit is that a guy named um, Black w went to all these places in New England and actually saw the things that Lovecraft later would base his stories on, that all this stuff was real. So like uh, instead of Dunwich, he goes to uh, Atoll or Athol. I, I don't know how you pronounce it. Athol? Which... Athol, yeah, Massachusetts, which Lovecraft sort of based Dunwich on. So anyway, um, if you do get this book, you you got to go online and and look up the uh, annotations because it, it's so deep and it plays with time. It's it's a brilliant thing. But I just wanted to show his picture of Wilbur because it's perfect. That's Wilbur Whateley. This yeah, goatish, yeah. this goatish, you know. Goatish like, at the time, he's like only like maybe twelve years old here. Or, you know, I mean, you know, and. Uh, it's naturally tall, goatish yeah. looking. You know, he's got uh, you know, hoofs for feet, right? And well, well, yeah. Why he always wears uh, a lot of pants. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you Where, know, yeah. Uh, but you know, the, the problem of you know adapting those kind of stories to film, of course, is like, well, how do you you know? It becomes complicated. So let's simplify the thing, right? He's a half brother, but he looks all human. Let's done. You know, <laughs> they could have made him look more goatish. I think that would have been cool. But you know. Stockwell looks well, yeah, but this is but the, the Dunwich Horror is kind of a love story too, or a seduction at least, and so you got to have a handsome guy to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I, I guess so. Again, it, it in the in the in the in the adaptation, that's true. Right? Yeah, that's got yeah. the whole thing with you know Sandra D. You have to, but he has to. He's charming enough, right? That's the whole thing. Is Stockwell's character is charming, so he can like influence her, like when they're in the library, right? And can't I borrow the book? Hey. You know, I know yeah, she goes, hours, Do you see his eyes? Yeah, <laughs> Ruby, man. You know, yeah. it's just so, it, but it's fun. It, it is what it is. But like, it's low budget. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah. it, and, and, I, and it feels half hearted compared to some of the other AIP uh, films, I think. You know, it's, maybe it's on the same par. I don't know. The uh, Die Monster Die is pretty uh, check in. You know, well, Dan, I mean, Daniel Haller didn't have any great you know, desire to make a Lovecraft story. I mean, he just got a, offered a job, like he said, you know. So. And he said, hey, I can be a director, so I'm going to do Yeah, right? yeah. But, but you would hope that with an art director, he would like get into it, like, you know, from a, you know, composition, visuals, all that stuff. And it just feels very pedestrian. Well, ex except, um, you know, the scene where she goes and, and, and meets Wilbur's twin, the, the woman, you know, upstairs where, you know, in the in the book, he's like an invisible monster. But that one scene, it only lasts about maybe thirty seconds. You know, where all these tentacles get her, and uh, you see an enemy. I, mean? I don't know what she's what he what it's doing to her. I mean, as a matter of fact, wouldn't that wouldn't the story just stop there? Because now they have a woman that he could impregnate. <laughs> Although that's not yuck So I, I don't know. That was a little confusing. You, you, you got to do the champion, right? You have to get the yeah, circle. You got to chant. Yeah. You got to chant, right? You know, tonation. You know. So I don't know, you know, but uh, yeah. You but know, you know, yeah. the beginning, the beginning of it is uh, Wilbur uh, going to Arkham University, you know, to hear a lecture by Dr. Willett. And he talks about, well, I'm doing research on the Necronomicon. And they just have the Necronomicon <laughs> in the library <laughs> on display, you know, uh, with a glass. Now, you know, in the story, um, it's, it's sort of the same thing. By the way, in the story, it's very moody. How Lovecraft sets the mood of Arkham and how it's real, you know, the whole countryside is very degenerate. Mm -hmm. And Lovecraft gets his obsession about, you know, there's 
there's a degenerate, there's a decayed Waitleys and the undecayed Waitleys. You know, every family had a decayed part and an undecayed part, which goes back to his obsession about, you know, uh, I think about his, both his parents dying in an asylum mm -hmm. and this genetics going to come and, you know, claim him one day, I think. Gonna come back from, you know, yeah, your, your, your history, your past comes back to haunt you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. And you can't, you can't, you can't escape your genes. You know? Yeah, it's very, you know, and that's like the inevitability. Like it's almost, you know, it's that doom of like, I came from this family and it's just a matter of time. It's like, you know, even the shadow over Innsmouth at the very end, you know, uh, going to break out my cousin from, you know, the, uh, you know, the asylum, right? You know, it's like, you, you know that you, you've kind of come to the conclusion that, yep, I'm, I'm one, I'm part of it, you know, so I'm just going to go with the flow. But in the inevitability, it's that, you know, it's that real, you know, you know, being crushed by the hand of the yeah. inevitable, but, um, and no, and no freedom, you know, no choice at that point. Like that's, but, that, that's horror, you know? Yeah. So in the original story, I mean, Wilbur is killed pretty quickly, you know, when he tries, you know, cause he's trying to get the Necronomicon cause he talks about, well, I got the John D thing, but uh, it's fragments and, you know, I need to get the Latin one because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's more accurate or the Greek one. Um, and, um, you know, Dr. Willett won't let him do that. Wait, no, Dr. Armitage, I'm getting the two guys. Dr. Armitage won't let him do that. And um, in the story, he, uh, he tries to uh, steal it, but he's, he's torn apart by dogs, mm -hmm. you know, pretty immediately. And uh, it's a horrific scene, but, but Lovecraft gives almost like, uh, you know, like, like an autopsy description of him because everybody talks about Lovecraft. Oh, he's so vague and it's always unnameable and knowable and this and that, but he can get very specific about mm -hmm. his monsters. In this particular sure. case, it is one of the more like really detailed. You should put up the, uh, the sculpture of him that you had at the festival. Um, uh, yeah. So well, okay. you had another one where he's, <laughs> where he's right. There he is. Yeah. And that is pretty much what, the story says of him, you know, I mean, it's, it's a really, you, the height was right. It was like eight feet tall or nine feet yeah, tall. Or, it, yeah. Being um, in person, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's described, you know, like the, no one would say this is a normal looking human being, right? I mean, <laughs> just, you know, even if you wear a trench coat and hat. So like the whole thing with Dean Stockwell seducing Sandra D is it's just kind of amusing, but you get it. I mean, that's why you make those changes to adapt. Yeah, just briefly, this is after he's been killed and um, by the dog. Lovecraft, uh, yeah, Lovecraft right, writes uh, above the waist. It was semi anthropomorphic, though his chest, where the dog's rendering paws still rested watchfully, had le leathery hide of a crocodile or alligator. The back was piebald with yellow and black, and dimly suggested. The squamous, one of your favorite words. The squamous <laughs> coverings of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, it was for the worst. For here, all human resemblance left and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur. And from the abdomen, a score of long greenish gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply, which is the guy has captured perfectly. Their arrangement was odd and seemed to follow the symmetries of some cosmic geometry unknown to Earth or the solar system even. <laughs> On each of the hips, deep set in a kind of pinkish ciliated orbit was what seemed to be a rudimentary eye. Whilst in lieu of a tail, there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annual markings and with many evidences of being undeveloped mouth or throat. So it goes on and on and on. So it's very weird sexuality kind of in there too, you know, uh, below the waist. Look out, it gets pretty nasty, you know. Pretty nasty, <laughs> of course, right? yeah. the waist is pretty bad too, but <laughs> yeah, and I think Dennis Paoli would definitely agree. We should we should have Dennis um oh, we'll get Dennis, yeah. Yeah. But um yeah, absolutely. But you know, you know, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. The the you know, the whole the whole story arc, you know, the you know, Lavinia getting impregnated by alien, you know, entities. Plus uh, she's an ab albino albino, kind of, right? Crazy <laughs> and um from the old, he mainly calls them like they we they call him Wizard Waitley quite a bit in the story. But in the, I mean, in the movie, uh, in the story, they call him Old Waitley. They do mention Wizard Waitley a few times. Mm -hmm. But in the movie, he's played by Sam Chaffee, and he's he's great. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't, I mean, he's not known now, but you know, I remember as a kid watching Doctor Kildare. Yeah, sure. Know, and he was so good in that. Um, he's good in everything he does. 
Um, yeah, but it seems like they, you know, again, uh, you know, not to knock it too much, but it's like you have this great cast, um, uh, you know, very talented actors, Ed Begley Jr., I mean, Ed Begley, excuse me, and then, um, you know, uh, Dean Stockwell, et cetera, and, and yet it doesn't all come together because, I, you know, the execution of the, the script adaptation is, and the very lackadaisical approach, you know, it's on cocktail napkins and it kind of feels that way, you know. Yeah. The makeup, even, even, you know, Lavinia, when she's in the asylum, you know, she's supposed to be, you know, an albino and, uh, you know, of the right age. And of course, what they did was they put a fright wig on this actress and she has perfect legs, you know, while she- Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah. and the, you know, the Whippoorwills. The Whippoorwills were great. That's the best. Oh, the Whippoorwills. Yeah, that, that's a really great kind of poetic, uh, they're like psychopomps and um, they, they can, you know, catch the soul of yeah. the departed. And that's a big theme in the story. Um, and it's in the, you know, it's also in the movie adaptation. Right, bit. yeah, it's the telltale, you know, that, that's how you know and you're kind of clued in when yeah. things are happening. Dunwich Horror is his most popular story. Is it? Yeah, oh, definitely. And um, one of the reasons is I was reading uh, Joshi's uh, biography and he said in 1945, they published oh. this for the army. Yes, that, the from Dunwich, that perspective, yeah. it's not, I, I don't know if today it is the most, you know, popular story of Lovecraft. It was <clears throat> this and um, Shadow of Innsmouth were serialized, right? I mean, or put into uh, chapbooks for the army, right? Yeah, they they were. It was like forty nine cents to buy. It was called the Dunwich Horror and others, you know, other horror stories. But it was like the first big introduction to, on a mass kind of market level because, uh, you know, it, it's it's amazing to think. But back then, people read a lot. <laughs> And the guys in the army read a lot, you know, and uh, uh, there is not a lot to do. And plus, it makes great toilet paper. Which... <laughs> That's right. That's another good part of it. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> during the war, the paper shortages too. So you know, the, you know, even Arkham House had problems publishing during that time period. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So so anyway, so the movie goes on, and, and it becomes sort of like a seduction between the the hip looking Wilbur and uh, Sandra D and. Uh, that's where it gets pretty boring to me. I mean, it's just, eh, you know. But, but you know, I, you know, I, I got to say, I mean, compared to the Haunted Palace where they changed the time period and all this stuff. Um, and I, you know, in this case, they've modernized it to modern audiences. Like it's, it's contemporary, right? So it, that's like, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deviation from AIP's normal formula of, uh, you know, the period Pope pieces and things like that. And so, you know. You know, one, one weird thing, I, I don't understand why they did it. I don't know if we asked Dan Haller about it. I guess we didn't. But uh, in the story, Lovecraft uses, um, you know, these old Indian stones, these standing stones, which is pretty creepy for the Devil's Hop Yard. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, it's it's like suddenly they're like, like in goddamn England, or I, I don't know what it is. You know, there's all these the weird statues. It almost looks like they're in ancient Greece or Rome yeah, or something. It, you know? Yeah, it has that, 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 that element. I'd have to look at it again to see if it's, you know, you know, what kind of uh, columns and stuff. But yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. Well, no, there's like, there's like these kind of like, yeah, like, like, you know, yes, yeah, like satyrs and, you know, all this weird, you know, devils and stuff. And who would make this? I mean, yeah, well, I my my I, I just wondered on the sound they had a sound stage and said, oh, we can reuse this from a different film. You know, I'm sure it was, yeah, repurposing uh, materials. Although but it's a it, big it's a big part of the movie and the story in the story too. I mean, that's the climax of the film. Um, yep. And then and the it, psychedelic imagery with all you know the 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 cosmic sea anemone with colors and everything. Well, you know, it's also the first uh, <laughs> the first story that really kind of you know, dives deep into the Necronomicon. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of quotes, a lot of quotes we use today when we mention Necronomicon is all from this story. Yeah, that's true. And this is like, uh, here's a quote, like, nor is, it, where Armitage is kind of remembering what he read in the Necronomicon, nor is it to be thought, ran the text as Armitage mentally translated it, that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters. Or that, the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. The old ones were, the old ones are, the old ones shall be, not in the spaces we know, but between them. Mm -hmm. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned, and to us unseen. You know, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great image, you know, these things between the dimensions, and they're, right. they're kind of there, and, you know, we can't see them, 
which goes back to like from beyond too and you know yep absolutely um but then again i go oh you know the impregnation why why you know it's like it's yeah i mean it, you know it is part of the story obviously you know that she that lavinia is impregnated by you know yog sath or that's his yog and um of course they would that's a cool that's sexual that's something you can shoot <laughs> you can have a beautiful woman writhing in orgasm I, and that's a, that, that was another funny part of the, <laughs> of the film adaptations because the only lovecraft might have liked this part because remember when uh dean stockwell has her on the on the slab on the altar mm -hmm. and he's performing the rituals and he spreads her legs and you think uh oh here it comes <laughs> you know what stuart gordon would do yeah <laughs> but what dean does is he puts a book <laughs> Yeah. it's a book holder yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know there's a lot of you know there are obviously a lot of suggestions uh you know sexual uh you know tension and and sexual suggestions trying to be uh you know put forth in the film adaptation yeah yeah you know not my okay, favorite of his time 1970s uh, oh. there's this big thing where did they go up to Esalen? I forget where he said they shot the hippies. Uh, yeah, yeah, right on the north side of Golden Gate Bridge. What's that? You know, there's that town they said that was kind of hidden off of, uh, off the road, right? And you know, this you know little hippie surf town. Right? Yeah, I don't know if it's surf town, but it's just this little coastal town. I thought it, I thought it was more like Esalen, but maybe not. That's south of that, but, um, um, but yeah, you know, so there, there's this all, all the hippies and there you, yep. some naked women and you know running around. It was the time, uh, man. It was, it was, it was cool. It was hip. It was yeah. what was happening. And so, yeah, you feel that's why it's very dated. It has that kind of, uh, you know, you well, know, that's what Dan was free uh, love and all that stuff going on. Yeah, Haller kept saying, "Well, we were all kind of hippies, I guess." And <laughs> I like, I like that. I, I should have read the interview again, but you know, where he talks about um, Dean Stockwell and he goes. Um, you know, well, well, Dean was kind of crazy. I don't mean that in a bad sense. We were all kind of crazy back then. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. But but, um, but but Stockwell really sells it. I mean, he he isn't he isn't like phoning this part in at all. When he when he does the ritual, I mean, even the stuff with, and this is all from alchemy and 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 stuff and 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 the you know the black mass of uh, with uh oh sorry my my computer just went crazy. Uh, you still see me? Oh yeah, I we still see okay. you in between. Know, the so sometimes it says like, yeah, it wants to update and everything goes away. But um, you know, with the chalices and and he's making these materials and he's got the, you know, he's got the ritual uh, dagger. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. it's I mean, it, those parts are pretty cool. Uh, yeah, the ritual magic aspect. Yeah, the ritual. It's a ritual magic, which also goes back to John D in a way, I suppose, mm -hmm. which never never appears in Lovecraft. I mean, the most you get is the chanting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, right. I, I don't remember like a thing where he's talking about like, you know, you know, take uh, two parts of this and, you know, take a chalice and, you know, that it's, but that's a Gothic thing too, as opposed to cosmic. If you were going to do one thing for that film, you know, having been a director yourself, um, what would you have done if you were, you know, with, with Dan on set and, and, and stuff, would you have, you know, what would you have done? Anything? I would, I would follow the story. I think the story is really good, you know? Um, and it's also, you know, I, we never were able to track this down, but um, at the end of it, of course, uh, 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 you know, um, Wilbur's twin escapes, right? He bursts out of the house that Wizard Waitley built mm -hmm. and he's invisible, right? And you see, you see tracks. Right. Then, then Armitage comes up with this cockamamie idea to, you know, to spray him with some kind of powder so he could actually see him. And as as St. points out, it's absolutely ridiculous. But the reason is so Lovecraft could write about these squiggly things and you know the face and all that kind of stuff. But what does that remind you of? A real one of the major science fiction movies ever made. Uh, what are you talking about? Which one? Well, I, what the I invisible think monster and, 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 and you know, casting no, it's, for, it's forbidden planet. Oh, the, yeah, the monster. It, it's exactly like that. It's the monster, you know, it's invisible. You see, you see footprints, right? And you see yeah, him yeah. when he's caught in the force field, yeah, it's absolutely. Almost the same thing, you know, it, it, it is it, from that perspective, yeah, you know, that that is, is 
that is interesting. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting to, you know, when you have these things that are again on filmable and nameable, yeah. uh, showing the impact, the evidence indirectly is, is, is a way to skirt showing the actual thing. You can yeah. tell something's going on, but you don't know what exactly it is. I mean, and again, I, I prefer that kind of methodology just because you don't linger on actually seeing it so that it like, all right, they, you know, the minute you see it, it, it becomes like, oh. I know it, it kind of falls down because when you don't see it, then you're in Lovecraft world where you're imagining it. You're, and you and, think of and, like, oh my gosh, how big is it? I don't know. And then yeah. you're trying to imagine, that's where it, that's and when where you it. see it, it's, it's done by Disney, you know, the monster and you know, it's got that kind of Disney esque thing, but it's definitely, the you, linger, horror, you know, the minute you show it and, and visually, you, once you put it on the screen and, and it lingers at, for any length of time, your brain is immediately taking it apart, looking at it going, Oh, well, all oh, that looks like a rubber monster or CGI. Yes. Yeah. And the minute you do that, it just deflates any kind of horror. And, uh, you know, uh, although John Carpenter and I got an argument about this, uh, <laughs> about the, you know, the haunting, the original haunting, there are elements of the haunting where her reactions are, you know, John would say it was a cheat. They didn't, you know, they didn't show anything, but I thought the reaction of the actors at times were, were more pro powerful, you know? Right. You know, and of course, Lovecraft describes him to the, the, you know, Wilbur's twin, you know, and, um, it's it's sort of like uh, a parody, you know, of of the crucifixion scene in 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 you know the the Christ myth, you know, where he's going like uh, yeah yeah, you know, all that kind of stuff. Help help, F Father Father Yog Sothoth, and it's Dan Burleson, which we can talk about. Points out he says you almost expect him to say, "Forgive them; they know <laughs> you know well, not what they do." <laughs> it, absolutely, it has this you know kind of Judeo Christian overtones and. It, it it does the good versus evil the impregnate you know the miraculous birth of, well let me let me this might be a good time to talk about this book and this is another it's called mm -hmm. hp lovecraft a critical yeah, study, study by donald burleson who i who i got to meet when i when i went out to um uh you know providence and don is uh he was like a professor of mathematics but there was a whole group of guys they weren't you know, we're calling ourselves the lurkers now, but they call themselves the gang. It was, you know, ST, Mark Michaud, who, you know, published Necronomicon Press, and Don was part of it. But this is a fantastic book. It, it, it Don't let it scare you off. It says a critical study, but it's a really neat overview of all of Lovecraft's works. And he talks about, you know, uh, the works themselves and kind of source materials. And um, it's, a, it's a fairly brief book. It was published back in 83 by um, Greenwood Press. But his thing is, and he doesn't call it the hero's journey, he calls it the hero's monomyth. And he says that uh, Dunwich Horror really falls into it, you know, the different phases that the hero takes. So he mentions like, um, you know, miraculous, the first thing is like a miraculous conception or birth, like Quasi Cottle or Jesus or, you know, Horus. And he mentions the twins are products of a sort of miraculous conception and birth, sire by the god Yogg-Sothoth, right? Mm -hmm. And the second one is like, uh, that kind of follows is the initiation of the hero. And he talks about how Wilbur is initiated by being allowed to take part in the Sentinel Hill rites that may even a hollow's eve. So that's part of it. Preparation, meditation, withdrawal, like, uh, like Buddha under the Bodhi tree. And he says, uh, Wilbur's withdrawal meditation consists of his studies of ancient books, ancient books with his grandfather through long hushed afternoons. And then the fourth one is a trial and quest. You know, it's like uh, the knight trying to get the Holy Grail. And Wilbur's quest is trying to get the Necronomicon, mm -hmm. you know, out of uh, Arkham. And then, you know, death of the hero becomes, because of his quest, often dismemberment, like in Os Osiris or Orpheus. And, uh, or becoming dog food, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And Wilbur's death comes directly as a consequence of his quest when he is ripped to pieces. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's literally the same thing. Uh, yeah. Then descend into the underworld, as in the case of Jesus, uh, typically one sees here the theme of overcoming the forces of death. And he points out the descent to the underworld is, suggest is suggested symbolically by the descent of Wilbur's twin into Cold Spring Glen, the great sinister ravine described. Now that's a little bit, okay. Yeah. But um, then resurrection and rebirth, as in the case of Dionysus, you know, Osiris, Jesus, the, all these myths follow the same thing. But it, it does have that structure, and again... Yeah. 
you know, I, I know I'm, I'm pounding this, you know, with a hammer, a uh, very large hammer. Uh, well, and one other thing, but and then the, the ascension, you know, into like heaven or whatever. And he says ascension comes when the twin returns to his place of conception, mm -hmm. the great table rock atop Sentinel Hill and his return to the father. So it really does follow. Now, I don't know if Lovecraft even had that in mind or it was like, you know, subconscious. How could he not, or, John? Because it, it, it follows. The, he never mentions that. I know. I don't think he, he ever. This is something that Don came up with. Uh, yeah, but 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 this is from his letters or anything. Yeah, it's not from it. But but the pattern, the story, and the structure of the story just, you know. And again, this is why I find the story not satisfying. For me, it just to me, it, it's just, it's a little bit too um, germane and not germane. You know, just more pedestrian for what it's yeah. yeah. Whereas I look at a story like Colorado Space, which is just, uh, I think, amazing. You know, yeah, like, it, that's a real unique story. And that's his favorite story, by the way, Lovecraft's yeah. story. And, and, but um, I, I think you, you look at the two, and they're just worlds apart. One, one is much, you know, the Dunwich Horror is much more traditional, structured, good versus evil. Hero Quest, as, as, as you were saying, is, is pointed out. And given that yeah, we would we today you, you would call that the hero's journey because it's just you know and every every cliche fucking movie uses it you know uh, oh so that's why I find it like eh so much it's not and you know and the whole thing if you know if you're going talking about ascension at the end it's like why would his father care he doesn't care humans are insignificant so it's know. Like against all the tenets this is it why is and it's and it's literally on an altar on yeah the it just. And the devil's hot, it's called the devil's top yard, yeah. too. You know? I know. So, like, to me, it's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't mean hell as in a you know, Judeo Christian. Well, Love, Lovecraft mentions in his letters that he, that he quite liked the story and um, he identified with uh, you know, Armitage, mm -hmm. you know, like he's battling these cosmic forces. So, you know, I mean, look, nobody can be true to everything they, first of all, Lovecraft didn't have a master plan. He was he wrote what he wanted to write, right? What? <laughs> the mythos wasn't like laid out like people think. And well, you see, I, I think and... I thought he was being driven by some force from beyond. <laughs> that's you know. That's yeah. was. Actually, and this was his biggest payday. It immediately got uh, bought, and you know what? Is, how much he got paid for his biggest payday? Uh, five dollars. I don't know. Oh I come on. Five dollars. <laughs> No, it was a, well, this is 1927, $240, which probably was a couple thousand, right? I mean, back then. It'd be huge. Yeah. Then. So it, you know, it kept him in, a, you know, ice cream for a year or so. And ice cream, coffee. Ice cream and coffee, right. Beans. <laughs> Beans. <laughs> Beans. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a great diet. Yeah. <laughs> so, so wrapping up, you know, so here we go. We've, we've got. Uh, the Dunwich Horror, uh, you know, it was like 1970. Was that the right? 1970 was made. Yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, it's the first adaptation, of, uh, especially for film, of this story. Um, you know, we have the, the 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 crew from AIP, Dan Aller, who's you know was a, a veteran under Roger Corman for the uh, Poe films as an art director. Again, given a shot as a director. Um, very much of its time, you know, set uh, in the the crazy early 1970s, late 60s, you know, mentality of you know free love and yeah, free love yeah. and free books apparently and from the Arkham you know library. <laughs> you know, you just have good eyes, John, and you can say, hey, can I borrow that? Thanks. It's kind of groovy. Bring it oh, and also remember, it was like the first appearance of um, Coppola's niece, uh, Tyla. You know, she's in The Godfather. She's, uh, you know, she's uh, one of the sisters. She's a sister of the, you know. Oh, I. She's I, Godfather's uh, daughter. I just don't remember that fact. I love. Oh, God. I believe you, John. <laughs> we, we can do fact checking later and put that up yeah. on the screen. Um, so anyway, you know, first adaptation, not so great. Uh, it's, it's amusing just because of its, uh, you know, it, it's very time period oh i wanted to mention time capsule as of a, as a movie in an adaptation yeah because we mentioned the the goofy luck less baxter score but the other two movies that we talked about you know the haunted palace and the resurrected they have great scores ronald yeah. stein is a fantastic composer and yeah. he does a great thing for the haunted palace and then richard ban 
wrote the score for um, Resurrected. Yeah, I just wonder, you know, what 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 they asked him to, you know, less to say, hey, we need a we need a score, <laughs> and he's like, oh, this is so goofy, and he kind of took, you know, took the piss out. <laughs> I I, th- I think it's again another kind of uh, echo of uh, Rosemary's Baby that has that weird score, you know, yeah, with a harp- harpsichord and uh, but kind of rocky kind of thing, you know. <laughs> Oh, you got it? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. And then they, <laughs> the cosmic you know, echoes in the background. Yeah. But, I mean, I'll tell you the truth, John, the guilty pleasure, I do kind of like it. <laughs> yeah. The Dun Witch Pro you're talking about. Yeah. Me yeah. too. I, I, you know, I, there are some parts where it gets a little boring. But a lot of it is because of uh, Dean Stockwell, I think, because he's not phoning this thing in. And I think he'd be interesting to talk to him about how much Lovecraft he knows or, you know. Uh, well, let's make it so, John. Let's reach out and see if we can. Because it reminds me of it. Some of it reminds me of his character in um, uh, the David Lynch movie that he's in. Um, what is it? <laughs> I, I know. I, we're getting old here, folks. I remember anything. Um, yeah, well, the thing you made after Dune. Movie. I mean, it's a real popular movie. <laughs> we'll fix it in post, Jeff. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I, I think uh, you know we're we're basically at the hour. So um, good, great talking with you as always. Uh, you yeah. Know, look forward to the the next podcast. We'll we'll be having some guests, of course. You know, uh, you know, St. and hopefully uh, Dean Stockholm. We'll see.